This is a production of Cornell University. All right. Thanks, Sarah. Um, as she said, my name is Jenna Hirschberger. I'm a second year grad student in Mike Gore's lab. And today I'll be talking about one of several projects that I'm working on. Um, and this one's called an Android application for near infrared spectroscopy based phenotyping of cassava quality traits. So this project is part of a larger uh, PhenoApps project that's funded by uh, the NSF. And this project is led by Mike Gore, as well as Jesse Poland, who was here a few weeks ago. So the main problem that the PhenoApps project is looking to address is this one. Um, typically, when <laughs> breeding programs take notes, it's by hand on paper. You get bookshelves that look like this. Um, this is an actual photo from IITA of their breeding data. Um, also lovingly known as old school cassava base. Uh, so <laughs> Fino apps integrate um, data collection with the actual new cassava base out of BTI. Um, and that's one way that we are increasing the efficiency with which breeding programs can take phenotypic data. Um, but beyond this, uh, Fino apps also have the possibility of collecting data that's not possible by hand, um, such as spectral data and image data. So one of the other important parts of the Fino apps project is workshops, so deployment of the apps. And this, these are pictures from a workshop that we held at IITA in March. Um, and so we trained breeders on how to use the apps and ask for feedback on the apps that are being used um, and then potential apps that could be developed in the future. So we asked the breeders, what traits are you working on that could use a more efficient tool? Um, and we got a lot of responses. So one of them that we hadn't really put too much thought into before is dry matter content in cassava. Um, so dry matter content is really important to cassava breeders, to farmers, and to consumers. Um, cassava roots are the harvested part of the plant. They're mostly starch, um, and the dry matter is what is actually cared about. So the dry matter is a large component of yield. It's used as a proxy for eating quality, and it's really important for farmers, which factors into then variety adoption, um, as they want to grow crops that are actually going to be consumed by um, consumers and can be used for processing, for eating, things like that. So the problem though is cassava dry matter can be difficult to measure. So there are two main ways that it's normally measured through the specific gravity method and the oven method. Um, so on the right, we have the specific gravity method as measured last year in one of uh, Paula's fields. Paula is another uh, lab member of mine. So this method takes, you take the roots still in the field, take a subset of them from your plot weigh them in air and then in water and use a simple equation to translate that into dry matter content. The other method is the oven method, in which you take your samples back to the lab, you peel your roots, you shred them, you measure them before and after they go through the drying process. And that's how you get um, the dry matter content. The, there is though a third way that people have started using and this is NEARS or near infrared spectroscopy. So this is being used as a, it's, there's a benchtop spectrometer that's being used at SEAT. There are other organizations as well that have jumped on board. And it's been proven highly accurate, fast, um, and also, um, yeah, it's just very useful. So the problem, though, is you still have to take all your samples back to the lab, process them, and then put them through the spectrometer. So um, there's another version of this where instead of being in the lab that you have a handheld unit and so this is something that Ugo out of Jean-Luc's lab is exploring and he has shown that also that method can have high accuracy but um, the problem with these um, is the cost is prohibitive so before I go into that um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what NIRS is so NIRS is this uh, region of the electromagnetic spectrum from 700 to 2500 nanometers and the reflectance as measured by a spectrometer can be indicative of the chemical composition of whatever you're measuring. So it changes the reflectance patterns based on the um, carbon hydrogen, nitrogen hydrogen, and oxygen hydrogen bonds. Um, total carbon, 
carbon and nitrogen. So this chart shows some of the properties that can be measured by NIRS. Um, and then this is a screenshot from one of the apps we're working on that um, shows some variation between different routes for um, use rates. So um, because the cost is prohibitive for the near spectro spectroscopy, but it's a promising technology, we've been looking into lower cost options to use NIRS in the field. So we found this device, it's called SIO. Um, it has a smaller range than what's been used in the past to measure dry matter content in cassava. And so in order to move forward with this technology, I've been working with Ugo to subset his data from his handheld NIRS that has high accuracy and see if this range is still accurate in predicting dry matter using his uh, developed models. So with that, we've gone, we have reduced the accuracy from 96.7% uh, with holdout cross-validation to 93.3, but 93.3 is still pretty high for a tool that is a 200 times reduction in price. Um, so this, each unit is about $300 instead of tens of thousands of dollars. Um, so we're looking at something that is actually feasible for breeders to be using in their programs and could be really useful in taking dry matter data um, quickly in the field without having to transport samples um, and also accurately. So in order to then move forward with this project, Paula and I set up a small pilot experiment uh, upstairs in the lab here using roots from Wegmans. And that you can see in the picture on the left here, we're just practicing the protocol for scanning the roots. Uh, the device has a small plastic shield um, by the actual uh, spectrometer, and that you can put flush with the root slice, which the roots are already sliced to phenotype for different diseases. So handy there. Uh, you can just use the slices that are already cut and scan them. So um, we've worked on the protocol and now have moved into a pilot field trial. So Paula is currently in Uganda harvesting her GWAS trial for softness and the roots are already being phenotyped for uh, specific gravity as well as these disease traits that require the slicing of the root. So we've hired an extra team member for her to be able to scan the roots as part of the phenotyping process. And these, these, these same roots are then being taken for the specific gravity measurements. And we also have some of them going for the oven method um, just to round it all out. So this harvest is taking place starting this week. These pictures are actually from last year, but this is the idea of what will be happening. So, um, and then after we get the data from this pilot trial, we will then be um, making some prediction models. I'm looking into using partially squares regression, which will reduce the dimensionality of the spectral data and account for the multicollinearity between wavelengths. And then uh, we'll be doing some cross-validation and then hopefully some additioning, additional phenotyping for uh, model improvement with more, um, more measurements of dry matter and scans paired to be able to predict better. And ultimately, all of this will be packaged into an app for Android that will be able to join the rest of the Pheno apps in this suite of apps that are all free on Google Play for breeders to use. And with that, um, I would like to thank Paula and Ugo especially for their help on my project, as well as my committee, Mike, Rebecca, and Tim, the rest of the Gore Lab, the Pheno apps team, and the NSF. So. Thanks. And I'll take questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> So with those, we really doubt there's a lot of variation with those roots. We did measure them using a drying oven, and there wasn't a ton of variation, but some of the roots were actually statistically different from each other in dry matter. So we um, 
are waiting on a research license to be able to look at the actual spectra to start our actual model development. Um, so we don't know right now how that's going to look, but um, we'll see. That's why we actually need a pilot experiment to larger scale be able to tell. So yeah, so for this tool, um, it has a little cover on it that you can take off and then turn the device over, put it back in the cover, and you press a button and it'll calibrate for you. So in our protocol, we're doing that between plots. Um, it's probably a little bit overkill, but we'd rather have that than not have it correctly calibrated. All right, if there are no more questions, let's thank Jenna one more time. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.